Okay, so we're recording now. Welcome, my name is Jess Sappington and I'm the Food Systems Program Coordinator for the Regional Small Farms Program housed out of WSU Kitsap Extension. Tonight's our latest Dirt Tuck event and the first um, event of our new year in 2023, so welcome. Uh, for those that have not joined us for our virtual Dirt Talks previously, our events are hosted by WSU Regional Small Farms um, in conjunction with a local farmer or an egg specialist willing to share their expertise on a given topic. Um, tonight, we're excited to have partners with us from the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, Frank Curtin and Sean McDonough, and they'll be sharing with us information on how they can help farmers and forest land owners throughout the Puget Sound to install, install voluntary conservation practices through funding that they offer um, through NRCS and programming. So um, NRCS, as you know, programs are funded um, um, and offered national, but we're very lucky to have these two gentlemen with us locally here as resources for our area farmers. Um, the discussion is going to be presentation style, but if you have questions, please make sure to utilize the chat function at any time, and we can stop throughout the presentation to get those answered. But we definitely will build in a lot of time at the end for you to get any additional questions answered and have some discussion amongst the group. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Frank and Sean to give a little bit of info about themselves and before they start the presentation. Frank, do you want to? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jess, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Frank Curtin. I'm a resource conservationist with the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, Sean and I are located here in the Bremerton field office and our office services Kitsap and Mason counties. However, we have a, a crew of conservationists throughout Western Washington that, that provide the same services. And uh, so if you're not located necessarily in Kitsap or Mason, you could still reach out to us and we'll connect you with the, the local uh, co-worker of ours that, that could help you out. And um, yeah, I'll introduce you to Sean McDonough now as well. Uh, he's gonna be the main point of contact moving forward. Uh, this is actually my last week in the Bremerton office, um, moving over to the Wenatchee field office, uh, but I have covered these uh, these few counties for the last five, almost six years now. Um, so there's been a lot of great projects that we've implemented over the years uh, through some of our programs. And with that, I'll let Sean introduce himself and start off on the presentation. All right, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Jess. You really bothered um, Dan. So my name is Sean. Um, I'm also a resource conservationist here at the Bremerton Field Office. Um, I'm new here, only been here about two months now came from the Pross area. So I've worked with a lot of dry land wheat folks, but I'm excited to kind of be out here working with you guys for um, some of the urban ag and some of the smaller farm operations. So today's presentation, as Jess was saying, we're just kind of kind of kind of go over our programs, kind of the application process for a bit and go into a little bit um, of detail on some of our conservation practices. So for our agency at a glance, uh, we were first formed in 1935 uh, due to the Dust Bowl and everything. The federal government kind of saw the issue of what was happening um, with the soil eroding away from people kind of farming it a little too heavily and overutilizing things. Um, we were originally called the Soil Conservation Service because that was the main focus. And then in 94, it was rebranded as the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, to kind of reflect that we weren't just focusing on soil. We're also working with water quality, air quality, wildlife habitat, and things like that. Up on the right, we have Dr. Hugh Hammond Bennett. He was the first chief of the Soil Conservation Service, and he's uh, coined as the father of soil conservation and is kind of the first one who had a lot of the big ideas that kind of pushed us forward. So with NRCS, we kind of offer two different um, types of assistance. The first one is technical assistance. That's where you can kind of reach out to us or look at our website and kind of get information that you kind of need. And it's not, um, you don't have to pay for it or anything. It's all free. You can call us up, ask us any questions you have, and we'll be happy to help, whether that's on kind of like cover crop questions, kind of like what kind of high tunnels and stuff to use. We can kind of help you out with things like that. Um, the other part of our assistance is the financial assistance, which most people are more familiar with, which is kind of broken into four different big programs, um, which I'll go into a little more detail here. 
Our first one is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP for short. It's our flagship kind of program that helps producers kind of integrate conservation into their work and lands. And it's generally the one that gets the most funding and has the most people participate because it's um, the easiest one to kind of get into and has the lowest kind of bar to kind of jump over. Um, so with EQIP, we're providing technical and financial assistance at the same time to help producers um, and forest landowners address natural resource concerns for anything from improving water and air quality, um, increasing soil health, or improving or creating wildlife habitat, and a large variety of other resource concerns that can range pretty far. Our next one is the Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP for short. Um, and what CSP is, is it's a program that helps you um, build on your existing conservation efforts with the use of enhancements, which enhancements are our conservation practices, but kind of taken to the next level where it's basically the same kind of base thing that you have to be meeting, but then we have some extra requirements to kind of take it to kind of improve it a little further and everything. The big difference between CSP and EQIP um, is one is CSP's contracts or five-year contracts that get an annual uh, minimum payment of $1,500. So if you I don't know if you have, want to watch this. Um, if you have everything kind of, we can get, you know, you could have everything kind of done in that first year, but then you'd still be on a contract for the next four years and still getting that $1,500 annual payment. Whereas with EQIP, you can have a contract that could just be a year where it'd be something like a high tunnel. And as soon as it's installed and we certify it for you, you're basically done unless you want to come back for something else. Um, another big one for CSP is CSP has you, you have to enroll all of your land that's under your name that you have with um, FSA, whereas EQIP, you can kind of pick and choose what farm attracts um, you want to enroll into the program. Next up, we have the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, um, RCPP for short. It's a partner-driven approach to conservation that funds solutions to natural resource challenges, but more on a regional level instead of kind of a statewide thing. So it's a little more limited. Um, right now, the Puget Sound team really only does RCPP through the Puyallup watershed um, as each kind of like region has their own kind of thing they're working with. And lastly, we have the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. Uh, ASAP for short, um, it's just an easement program to help protect agricultural viability and related conservation values on eligible land. It's comprised of two components, the agricultural land easements component, ALE for short, where it's easements done with land trust and other large entities such as um, cities and um, ones like that to protect agricultural land by limiting non-agricultural uses. And then we have the wetland reserve easements um, WRE for short, which is easements to help landowners kind of protect wetlands that were um, degraded due to past agricultural uh, uses. So now that we've kind of talked about NRCS programs, let's take a look at eligibility. For NRCS programs, eligibility plays pretty large roles. It helps us make sure we're providing services to the folks that need it. Eligibility can be broken down into the four items that we kind of have shown here. Uh, farm and track numbers, uh, the 941 adjusted gross income form, the AD 1026 highly erodible land conservation and wetland conservation certification form, and the CCC 901 members information form. Um, all four of these items are done through the Farm Service Agency, FSA for short, um, as they're the ones in charge of taking this information and putting it into their system, which we then pull that information out. Um, to make sure you're eligible to move forward in the application process. So first up, I'll talk a little bit about the farm track numbers. These are numbers that we use to identify your property in our system, as well as how we plan out conservation practices on your property. Um, to get farm track numbers, it's not too difficult. You just fill out an 802047 customer data worksheet to get some customer records filled out with FSA so they can get you in the system, as well as a property worksheet so they know what like parcels you're trying to get farm and track numbers for. Next, we have the adjusted gross income form, which is usually just commonly known as the AGI form, which is an income disclosure form um, that you fill out to certify that you've make, made less than 900,000 
on average. And it looks at the average of your last three years of income. Um, this is a form that needs to get filled out every year that you're doing an application. Whereas with your farm and track numbers, once you get them done, unless you're wanting to change things up, you don't need to go back to FSA for. Then after that, we have our AD 1026 form, which is basically saying you're not going to grow commodity crops on highly erodible land. You're not going to grow it on wetlands and you're not going to convert wetlands to grow crops. Um, it can be a little complicated, um, but the application packet that we send out to folks does a good job of walking you through it and kind of explaining it. Um, but you can also come to anyone in FSA or NSCS and we can kind of help you walk you through it and help you fill it out. And then finally, we have the 901 members information form um, that you fill out. And then FSA uses this to generate their 902 form, which is a farm operating plan for payment eligibility. Um, and just like the AGI form, the 902 form is needed every year that you're doing an application. Um, but if nothing changes year to year, generally you can just reach out to FSA and they can just do an updated 902 for the next year. You won't have to fill out another 901 every single year. So now that we've kind of talked about eligibility for the NRCS programs, we can kind of go over the application process. Um, one disclosure is you don't need to complete all the eligibility items that I've kind of listed out here. Um, you really only need to do the um, getting the farm and track numbers and the 901 prior to kind of like doing an application and everything. The AD 1026 and the AGI forms usually are done after you've kind of submitted your application. So once you've established customer records, and that's, as I said, is the farm and track numbers and getting your uh, 902 with FSA, you can kind of fill out one of our application forms. And our application form is called the CPA 1200. And it's a general application form that can be used for all of our, for the majority of our programs and can be provided to you either by an NRCS representative like myself or Frank, or you can find it at our website at the link that I have in the um, PowerPoint presentation. So what does the CPA 1200 look like? Um, it's a pretty simple form. It's only got these three pages. Uh, the first two are where you're kind of filling out the majority of it, and the third page is really just the signature form. Um, one thing that kind of can kind of trip folks up, though, is on page two, kind of at the top, we have a historically underserved category list, and this is four groups of folks that historically have been underserved by USDA due to any variety of reasons, and so if you fall into one of those categories, you can self-certify as one of them. And then you'd get into different fund pools that the general population wouldn't. Um, I won't go into really any details on any of the categories. Um, there are additional helpful pages after in the application packet after the end of the application that kind of go over into details about um, kind of walking you through the questions and also kind of explaining the terminology and does a good job of explaining each of the historically underserved categories so you can kind of know whether you fit into it or if um, none of them kind of match up with you. Um, one question we get from a lot of folks is when can you submit your applications? Um, and our CS Tech application is year round for Equip and CSP. So whenever you've got the form filed and you've got your customer records filled out with FSA, you can submit it to us. So there's no real hard deadline that you need to get it into us by. We do have application deadlines every year, but this is so we can kind of break the applications up into fiscal years to get an idea of workload and every year so that way we're not overwhelmed. Um, but on the off chance that your application misses that deadline, um, it'll just get rolled over into the next fiscal year. So you wouldn't have to fill it out again unless anything changes or if you're wanting to do um, different property or if you want to do the application under like an entity instead of an individual. Um, generally, our application deadlines are in the fall, usually around September, October. This last year was October 13th as our fiscal year starts October 1st every year. Um, so now that we've kind of walked through the 1200 and you've got it filled out, um, you can either scan and email it back to whoever you've been working with at NRCS, or you can just mail it back to them physically in the office, whatever ends up working best for you and based on where you're at and what you have, uh, what resources you have available. 
Um, and now that we've kind of gone over that and you've submitted your application, what kind of comes next? So after you've submitted your application to us, what happens is we take it and we put that information into our digital system to get y'all in there. And that'll be what kind of automatically rolls you over into the next year if you happen to miss the application deadline. And so after we've done that, we'll reach out to you and schedule a site visit to kind of come out, check out your property, kind of talk to you about what your goals and objectives are and everything to kind of see what it is you're really looking to kind of do out there, what kind of resource concerns you're um, kind of seeing out there, whether that's something like with high tunnels for trying to improve your plant productivity, or if you've got kind of compaction issues and maybe we can kind of help you out and talk about cover crops and everything. And so once we're kind of out there, we'll also do an inventory to um, double check that the resource concerns are out there, meets with our tools and everything, and we can start talking about different options and alternatives that'll work out. And so going to that, that's where we start talking about conservation practices, and this is where I'll pass it over to Frank. All right, I'm going to try and here my screen can you hear me all right yep we can hear you all right perfect thank you and can you see my screen now as well yep you're inside projector man Perfect. Thank you. All right. So now once you have an application in uh, in the system, let's talk about what we actually go out and, and install on the ground. And we could take a look at some of the projects that we've done uh, right here in our team in our local region. Um, so we break everything up into different land uses, whether it be cropland, pasture land, forest land, um, or range land, which rangeland is on the east side of the state. Uh, so we'll start by taking a look at some of the cropland practices that we uh, show or we have projects on. Um, one of our most common, um, is there a way to, can everybody see that bar up top? Is there a way to hide that? No, nobody sees it but you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, one of our most common projects uh, funded through the EQUIP program is the High Tunnel Initiative uh, to extend the growing season here in Western Washington. Uh, cool season crops could be grown all, all winter long and then warm season crops like your tomatoes and peppers, you could just get to market a lot sooner. Um, we also can provide cover crop, whether it be a uh, a compaction layer that you might have out in your fields. We go out and we analyze and, and take a look at cropland and determine what potential issues there are. Say you have some ponding issues, we could go out and do infiltration tests, uh, water infiltration tests on the soil and compaction testing, uh, soil organic matter testing to, uh, and these are usually visual analysis, um, digging soil pits and, and that sort of thing. And if there's a compaction layer, we could potentially uh, look at doing a cover crop with a, something like a tillage radish that'll break up those compaction layers. Um, or whether it be soil organic matter depletion, we could look at cover crops that increase that soil organic matter. Um, conservation crop rotation and cover uh, conservation cover our other projects. Um, so here you have in this picture on the right, um, is a, uh, I believe it was a zucchini cash crop that was then seeded in between the rows with a cover crop for the winter. Uh, so once it went fallow in the fall and the cover and the cash crop started to die out, you had that cover crop there all winter long to prevent, uh, soil erosion. Um, and there was a combination of rye vetch out there uh, with some vetch to increase your, your nitrogen content. Uh, additional projects that could be implemented through the EQIP program on cropland are pollinator plantings to increase uh, pollination of crops. Usually these are done either in between rows of your cash crop or on the borders of cash crops. Um, 
Same with hedgerows and filter strips. Um, basically, we go out there and we analyze those resources to, to find out what kind of plants you have and what blooming seasons you have throughout the summer, uh, spring, summer, and fall. And if there's a lack of pollinator habitat, we could look at uh, increasing that habitat. Uh, irrigation efficiency is another one uh, that we do. If you're doing all like overhead irrigation, for example, um, we could look at doing some analysis of, of what your current water usage is and seeing if a uh, project could be implemented to reduce the amount of water that's being used during the summer months uh, through the implementation of something like uh, micro irrigation. Um, and we also have nutrient management uh, projects where we could look at what your current use of fertilizer and what your inputs and outputs are on your cropland and uh, determine whether or not we could uh, reduce the amount of nutrients that are being used but still get those same yields that you're you're expecting from your cash crops uh, to better balance the the nutrient usage on forest land so we work with both uh, farmers and forest landowners um, and if you're a farmer that has forest land on your property we could look at uh, evaluating that as well um, common projects in our area are pre-commercial thinning to reduce the stocking density and improve forest health um, we have in our area also quite a bit of root rot where you'll have a cluster of dug fir trees that are dying because of a uh, uh, natural disease that we have in the area um, but we can look at replanting those root rot pockets with something that's less susceptible or resistant to to the disease uh, we also do so those are like an example of a, a planting project uh, we also do riparian forest buffers so if you're a livestock producer and you have streams running through your property uh, if the cattle are going directly into those streams and potentially causing a uh, water quality issue, we could look at fencing them out uh, of that area and installing a riparian forest buffer to improve water quality. Uh, and we also do fish passage projects. So if you have streams going through your property and uh, you have a stream crossing, say an old culvert or a bridge of some sort that's a barrier to fish, we could do an evaluation to see um, if it is in fact a barrier to fish such as salmon uh, and trout. And if it is, we could look at uh, replacing that structure with something that's fish passable. Um, and if you have forest land that you don't do anything with and you're not sure what to do with it, uh, we could assist with forest management plans that uh, help kind of guide what your long-term and short-term goals are for that forest land. For pasture land and livestock operations, um, we have a whole bunch of things to improve uh, water and soil quality, uh, as well as uh, pasture improvements. So we could do things like waste storage structures or compost facilities um, if the if the manure is out in the rain all winter long, we, we want to kind of get that covered to um, make sure that it's not leaching into groundwater um, or surface waters. And so through that, we could uh, do a composting facility or waste storage structure to store that and, and compost it uh, in an appropriate manner. Uh, and through that, we uh, implement comprehensive nutrient management plans, which are in-depth uh, plans that look at all of your inputs and outputs on your operation to make sure that we're we have a balanced budget at the end of the year and we're not um, putting too much nitrogen or uh, other harmful products back out into the environment and we're kind of balancing everything out um, we also do uh, rotational grazing plans where if you have say a large hundred acre field that's uh, all just one pasture and the livestock are kind of have access to the whole thing at, at all times of the year. Uh, rotational grazing plans are used to install cross fencing and, and break those pastures up so you could move the livestock around to each pasture, uh, allowing for certain times of the year for the pasture to, to rest and be able to grow and not be overgrazed. Um, and we also have heavy use areas around water troughs and that 
that sort of thing to um, improve soil health. So uh, working with us today, um, I'm part of the Puget Sound team here in Bremerton. We cover Kitsap and uh, Mason counties, but also King, Pierce, and Thurston counties. And so all of our, um, our agency is broken up into local working groups. So our five county team is called the Puget Sound team. And through that, we have uh, all of our local partners uh, whether it be U.S. or Fish and Wildlife, State Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. Uh, one of the big ones is all of our conservation districts. We have uh, Kitsap Conservation District on our call today. Um, and as a local working group, we kind of prioritize what uh, we want to do locally and what our biggest resource concerns are and what our priorities are. And so for uh, 2023, these are kind of the priorities that we're focusing on. Um, and that provides a specific pot of money specific to our region that could be used to, to look at uh, resource concerns that, that are impacted by water quality, soil health, uh, wildlife habitat, and plant degradation. And then I know um, part of uh, Jess's area of coverage through WSU is also Jefferson and Clallam County. And so for those two counties, you're part of the uh, Northwest team um, and the priority resource concerns for that area uh, this year are uh, plant and wildfire and aquatic habitat, as well as water quality. Uh, so that's kind of a breakdown of the specific uh, components that we're looking at to improve and in our region, but we also have state fund pools that are eligible for the entire state, which in, include a large range of things from Olympia oyster restoration uh, to irrigation efficiencies to uh, wildfire hazards, uh, especially in Eastern Washington. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of different, different projects where we get to fund uh, the EQIP and CSP. Uh, programs. And then another one um, Sean had mentioned about uh, the technical side of things where we can provide technical assistance. And one of the tools that our agency manages is the web soil survey website. Um, and I thought I'd go through and do a quick demo of what this website uh, is used for and how it could help uh, folks locally who are farmers and, and forest landowners. And so if you go to the, if you just Google web soil survey, it's going to be the first thing that shows up. Um, and this is what the homepage looks like. Um, so on the homepage, there's lots of good information. A lot of people just jump straight to the green button uh, to get started, but there's a lot of instructions and exactly like how-to guides all along this right side column uh, that are really useful if you've uh, never used the website before. And there's also a mobile app that you can put on your cell phone and see in real time where you are out in the field. Um, to, to see what soil types you have. But for now, I'm gonna jump right into it and click the, the green bu uh, button to get started. And so the first thing that pops up is a map of the US. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can navigate to um, specific areas, but the quickest one, you could either zoom directly into an area or you could go to the address tab and just had a really good idea to jump into the uh, Kitsap Conservation District's uh, property where they have a farm uh, at the Conservation District office. And we'll use that as part of our demo uh, to, to show you what this, this tool could be used for. So here we zoomed in, this is the Kitsap Conservation District office uh, here in Kitsap County. Uh, there's their parking lot here. They have a high tunnel here. 
and then they have a bunch of cropland out here where they produce a lot of pumpkins and uh, squash and, and a whole diverse amount of, of row crops. And uh, Diane Fish, who's from the Conservation District and is on this call today, could talk about that a little bit uh, to give you guys uh, some, some background on that. So then basically this just zoomed us in to that address and here, in this corner, you have the AOI feature, the area of interest. You could either do just a straight square or rectangle, or you could do a specific polygon um, where you draw out uh, any shape that you want. So if I just click and drag our area of interest, I like to overshoot the boundary that I'm looking at. I like to go uh, over property lines just because soils could be uh, very close to the edge of a property line and you might miss something where you get out in the field and you're like, hey, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, but it could be because uh, soil type that was just off the property line um, is actually in fact on your property. Uh, so from here, we have all these tabs up here. The first tab, uh, once you click or once you select your area of interest, you go to your soil map. And here it turns out we only have one soil type, so it does cover the whole area, but it's very possible that there's another soil type just off of this area. Uh, but if we're looking at just this parcel, um, then yeah, you're pretty much set with one soil soil type. And this particular soil that's mapped uh, in this area is a Kapausen gravelly ashy loam with an average of zero to 6% slopes. And so if you just go ahead and click the, the soil type, you'll have a report uh, map unit description that pops up. And this gives you just a whole bunch of information of what you can expect to find with this soil type. Uh, all of the soil types have a, a national map unit. Um, and over here, you'll see the map unit symbol for, for this county, their numbers. Uh, so this one's soil type 22 for Kitsap County. Uh, if you go to a different county, you could have this same soil type, but you'll have a different uh, map unit symbol. Uh, so if we take a look at this, Soils map unit description, um, you could expect to be at an ev elevation of anywhere between 50 to 900 feet above sea level uh, with a mean annual precip of 30 to 50 inches, a mean annual air temp of 48 to 52 degrees, and frost free period of 150 to 220 days. And then farmland classification um, for this soil type, you'll see that all uh, of this soil type is considered prime farmland. Uh, this is this could be important for certain programs that you're applying for, like the uh, easement programs. We we try and uh, put easements on areas that have high quality farmland. Um, oftentimes, you could also come across um, another another type of farmland. It'll be farmland of statewide importance or you could have prime farmland with modifiers to it. So something like prime farmland if drained. So that could be uh, farmland that uh, might have a lot of saturation throughout the year and it would be better farmland if it had some drainage or you could have uh, prime farmland if irrigated. So that's a soil type that's very productive but could be in droughty conditions and um, if it was irrigated farmland, then it would be considered prime farmland. So those are kind of modifiers that you could look for. Uh, the next step is the unit composition. And so basically what they're saying is 85% of the time you see this soil type mapped when you go out there, um, you'll, it'll be 85% Kapausen, but it'll have uh, upwards of 15% potentially different minor components to it. And so if you read um, this profile and the profile is um, gravelly ashy loam for the first 15 inches and then loam between 15 and 30 inches and then a gravelly loam from 30 to 60 inches. If you're 
digging or if you're out in your cropland and you're saying, well, that doesn't seem to make sense. This this has a little bit more of a uh, wetter component to it. Um, you could take a look at your minor components, which are listed below. And these are all local soils that we have in our area that could be potentially a part of this soil type. And so um, the Alderwood series um, is uh, another component that could potentially be out there. But if you're seeing something that's showing more signs of like hydrology, or it seems like it might be more saturated or wet, um, maybe you have a DuPont uh, component to your, your soil, just because down here, if you take a look at this, it'll show that it has a hydric soil rating. And so that means there might be, um, it might be in a, a little bit of a swale. And so you get standing water for parts of the year. Um, so even though it is a Kapausen soil, um, due to it being in like a low lying area, you might get some more water, standing water. Um, and so, yeah, this is basically just the, the soil description. And then if you go to the Soil Data Explorer, Um, here, there's just, you can spend endless amounts of time taking a look at different um, soil features. Um, so there's all sorts of different uh, reports that you could run. So say you're in, um, it, say your, your land use is pasture land, and so you're looking at installing some fencing. Uh, you could do a, a report on fencing to see whether that's a good soil uh, for fencing. <clears throat> and here, this is a well-suited uh, soil type for running a fence line. However, if you look at the DuPont component, you'll see that due to that hydric rating, it might not be as good of a soil uh, just because your fence post might need to be set a little bit deeper. Um, so there's just an endless amount of uh, reports that you could run in this website to tell you all about your soil type. Um, another one that's helpful is on this tab, underwater features, you could see your depth to water table report, um, which will tell you approximately how deep your, your water table might be. Um, and then also your flooding and ponding frequency. And so you would think red might be bad, but in this case, unless you want flooding or ponding, um, then you're, you're not gonna have any in this soil type just because there's really no restrictive layers and, and nothing that's gonna create a really high water table to, to cause ponding or flooding. Um, so you won't have that in this soil type unless potentially you have say that minor component of a DuPont or something that has more of a hydric rating in it. Um, you also have some uh, erosion features here. This is a little bit more handy for Eastern Washington where you get a lot more uh, wind erosion. Um, and you also have, if you have forest land, um, you could take a look at the vegetative productivity for Washington State's uh, tree site index, which is basically a report that will tell you um, how tall certain trees will be expected to grow within either 50 or 100 years. So for in Western Washington, um, we use the uh, tree site index for Douglas fir, which was um, kind of mapped out by soil type in a research project that took place in 1966. And it'll tell you based on this soil type, you could expect your average dug fir to grow 123 feet in height within 50 years. Um, so that's that's an important tool if you're looking at growing trees in the in the area. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to go back to our presentation. So really and, quick, Frank, before you yeah. move on from web soil surveys, so I know yeah. you. I've personally spent hours looking at different things on that. If a farmer um, 
is interested in getting assistance on how to use the tool, is that something that's appropriate for them to also connect with you guys on? Locally. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah, um, almost every time I go out for a site visit, I'll do one of these reports prior to going out. Uh, once I have a farmer's address, I'll usually bring a copy with me. That way they could have that as a resource. Um, and I run the reports that I think are most applicable to their operation. Typically, I learn a lot more once I meet with the producer so I could think about things and potentially run another report and email that as a follow up. Um, but if any farmer or, or forest landowner or general person that's interested in soils, um, I, even if they live in, in Seattle, they could give me a call and we could uh, go through web soil survey and take a look at what they're interested in finding out about. Um, and I could either help walk them through uh, running a report or I could make a report for them and send it out. So for sure, any questions definitely come our way. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. And um, the one thing uh, also a soil, so there's a lot of great information that could be found from web soil survey. We also, if things are really not looking like what's actually mapped out there, there's certain areas that were mapped a long time ago. Um, we do have in Western Washington a soil survey side of our agency uh, located in Olympia. And sometimes we could have those folks come out as well and provide technical assistance um, where they're the ones that are actually out in the field creating these maps, ground truthing it. Um, and certain counties and certain areas were done a really long time ago. Um, they're often done based on topographic lines and that's why you have that like, percent slope range for for soil types um but yeah so if we don't have the answer or if something in web soil survey isn't looking right uh, we could tap into the other side of our our agency and get those folks who are out there actually digging these soil pits and, and mapping it um to go out and do a site visit and provide technical assistance as well <clears throat> and with that, I'm not sure if there's any other questions, um, but basically I, I recommend folks, if you've got a cell phone handy, feel free to take a picture of this screen that has all of our contact information. Uh, like I said, I'm moving to the Wenatchee uh, field office starting uh, next week, but Sean is taking over the Bremerton field office, which covers Kitsap and Mason counties. Um, but basically, if you get a hold of any of us, if you're if you're in eastern Washington, if you're in California listening to this or <laughs> New York, uh, Florida, if you reach out to anybody in the NRCS, we'll be able to track down the local field office and get you in touch with somebody that can help you out. Um, and we're always happy to help answer any questions that anybody has. Uh, with that, I figured I'll open it up to any questions that anybody has. Yeah, thank you, um, Frank, for pointing that out. I'll go ahead and also along with um, the recording for today, because we do have folks that signed up that couldn't make it. Um, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with uh, your resources and then a copy of the slide deck so that folks can have your contact information and Sean's contact information as well, um, if they would like to follow up with you. I don't see any um, questions that have been put into chat, but while we're waiting, maybe folks are thinking about what questions they might have for you. Um, I do have a question going back to your guys's um, funding options. I know a big question that I get from folks um, is, you know, a lot of farmers know about your high tunnel program. They don't know that you're doing stuff with pollinator habitat. They don't know that they can access funding, even like you said, for um, livestock purposes and fencing and compost facilities. And so I'm curious, um, you know, would you recommend that a farmer, especially maybe a new and beginning farmer that's not super familiar with your programming um, and options, just connect with their local NRCS representative and invite them out to their farm? I know that some farmers are hesitant to do that because NRCS is federal, right? The USDA and, and yep. there's some feelings around that. But I think um, just pointing out that you guys do provide technical assistance and have that option. I think a lot of folks don't even realize that. 
Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, our agency is a non-regulatory agency. All of our programs are voluntary. Um, and the best way to honestly work with us, um, I like going out and walking a farmer's uh, I'm gonna property be in about 10 minutes. seeing what they're uh, interested in. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm always open to have, have folks just reach out directly to us and say, hey, can you invite us out? Um, we actually will not talk to any other agency about what you have going on at your operation. Um, we, we can't legally, we need to, uh, when it comes time to actually entering into a contract, if we have to do consultation with other agencies uh, that are regulatory, we actually have to have a landowner sign a release saying, we give you permission to actually reach out to these other agencies to talk about my farm. Uh, so we won't talk to, to other folks or other agencies. Um, I can't disclose if I'm working with someone, I can't disclose to his next door neighbor whether or not they're actually working with us. And honestly, uh, a lot of times farmers and forest landowners may actually be referred to us by regulatory agencies if they are running into a compliance issue uh, where we might be able to help them address that, that problem they might be having. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I'd say just reach out to us and and start with the phone or an email conversation. And and yeah, it's I think I I achieved the the best results by just walking a farmer. And typically uh, by the end of the day, they're they're happy to have had us out there, and and they're proud to show us their operations. And that's that's what I like to see. Yeah, no, good. Thank you for pointing that out, the regulatory versus the non-regulatory. Um, there is a question from Terry, it looks like in the chat. Um, her question is, who determines the amount of funding each county has for NRCS and or EQIP programs? Great question. Yeah, so that kind of comes down to uh, national headquarters. So although we are a federal agency, uh, we're set up in a very unique structure um, where basically at the highest level in the state of Washington, we have our state conservationists. So we are set up as individual states uh, when it comes to funding. So everything is funded uh, for the most part through the farm bill, which is released by Congress every five years. And that, so Congress provides the funding for our programs through the farm bill. And then our, division at national headquarters allocates that out to the individual states and then the states divvy that up based on fund pool. Uh, so we have fund pools that fund equip projects throughout the entire state of Washington. Certain fund pools are applicable to only certain regions. Uh, so like our local working group fund pool is a specific pot of money that's only divvied up between the specific counties within that fund pool. But then we have what's called like a beginning farmer fund pool. So when you're filling out that application, if you've uh, self-certified that you've been a farmer for 10 years or less, then you're, uh, by definition, considered a beginning farmer. And we have a specific pot of money or fund pool for the state of Washington that is only eligible or accessible to those that select beginning farmer on their application. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different pots of money that get divvied up, uh, but it's basically national headquarters gives it to the states and then the states divvied up that way. Uh, by fun pool. Yeah. So um, kind of going along with that question, I think um, some farmers who have looked into like your high tunnel program, for example, understand that there's a matching component, right? That there's, uh, you guys aren't going to fund the full amount. Is that vary from um, request to request based on, like you said, what they're eligible for, or is that pretty set amount? Each year we have a regional cost list that is that is provided to us. Um, and the, the idea is for a general farmer who doesn't fit any of these historically underserved categories, it's set up as a 75% payment rate that our agency covers. And then for a historically underserved person, it's considered 90%. However, that 
those numbers may not work out to be exactly 75% or 90%. Uh, the reason being it's a regional cost list and material costs, labor costs, everything varies drastically. Um, and so basically what I do when I go out and do a site visit is determine what specific project a person is interested in implementing. And then I put together what we call a cost share, uh, a financial assistance rate of what we would be able to cover for the project. Um, and it doesn't ever cover exactly 75% or exactly 90%. Um, it could be more, it could be less. And so we pay based on a specific component, not the project not based on what the project costs. Um, so for like a high tunnel, we have a set payment rate per square foot. And we say this year, this is what the payment rate is per square foot. And then it's up to the uh, contract holder to, to go out and purchase that structure. And if it comes out to be 50%, um, then they're, they're out 50% to cover the rest of the project. Uh, if it comes out 75%, then it's 75%. Um, but prior to entering into a contract, we kind of have all those numbers um, ironed out ahead of time. So that's part of the process of working with us is to figure out what our cost, what our financial assistance amount is going to be. That's good info. Yeah. So this is Diane Fish. Um, I'm with Kitsap Conservation District. And um, I just had a question about how your your cost share differs from uh, differs from ours in that you have a federal funding source. So, for example, if someone wanted to build a waste storage facility, um, and we were funding it, it comes through state money. If you were funding it, it comes through federal money. But they're both done on a reimbursement basis. So the landowner is responsible for the contracting and doing it all now one of the things that we often do is we're able to like align the completion of the project with um being able to reimburse everybody and so sometimes the landowner is not out that much how does that work with uh nrcs yeah um so we pay out on a project the contracted amount once that specific component of the project is completed and meets our specifications that are laid out in the contract. If you are a historically underserved participant uh, on your application, you are eligible for an advance payment. You get exactly 50% of the funds up front to, uh, to utilize. There's specific re requirements that come with that. Um, the the funds must be spent within 90 days of re, of receiving them and then uh yeah there's a there's a bunch of steps that that go into that process so there are options to um assist folks up front with some of the cost share um or financial assistance for a project but it does come with specific requirements that that it needs to meet um and it, and the person needs to be eligible for it. Um, otherwise, a uh, project is basically paid out once it's complete and we go out and certify it. And we can match funds with conservation districts uh, or other funding sources. We don't want folks actually making money on projects, uh, but we do often partner up with folks on really large or expensive projects. Um, we could we could match funds with different state or local agencies to to cover that cost. Okay, so I have another question, um, maybe more of an observation. Um, one of the things that we are required to do is use NRCS engineering standards, and we have some standard plans. Do you guys have some standard plans, or do you, are you doing site specific engineering? for things like manure storage facilities and stuff? They're very site specific. Yeah, we go out and, and do a, a 
an analysis on the specific site. Um, and depending on the type of structure, we have a geotechnical investigation that occurs where we have a drill rig that basically for uh, footings or something for like say a waste, a large waste storage structure um, or bridge or culvert, we have a geotechnical crew that goes out and drills into the subsurface of the uh, subsoils to find out what those uh, soil types are like to, to figure out what things like bearing capacity are going to be required for the project and then they're engineered specifically for that. And our level of engineering for large projects like that is pretty extensive. Um, basically any anything NRCS has specific standards that need to be met for all of our projects and since we're using taxpayer dollars we're trying to have a project uh, implement implemented to the best standards that we could possibly have. Um, so they're often uh, above and beyond what someone might do on their own, um, but they're they're built to last. So one final question. I know that um, for some programs, farmers do need uh, three years of the schedule on the IRS Schedule F. But you also indicated that there was a possibility, particularly for new and beginning farmers and um, BIPOC farmers, that a self-disclosure will work. How does that work? So for our application to be eligible as a beginning farmer, it's a self-certification and there is a 5% spot check nationwide, um, but it's a self-certification if you've been farming 10 years or less, you you would basically check the box that you're a beginning farmer. And if you don't have any years of farming or a, any schedule F to show for it, then that means you've been farming obviously for zero years. Um, so yeah, that that's not something at the field level we get involved in, but I'm not sure, did, did that answer the question? Well, I, just, I know that for some FSA program, uh, you know, loans and that sort of thing, they're looking at, oh, you know, those kinds of things. No, that's not required for our programs. Uh, you could be a subsistence farmer. You don't you don't have to be making a certain amount of income uh, per year from your operation to be eligible for our programs. So, yeah, yeah that, that's not a requirement. So another quick question that I had from another farmer is um, year to year. So if one year a farmer qualifies and does your um, high tunnel, for instance, and then they want to come back and they want to explore pollinator habitat projects, what is the requirement or elig eligibility, I guess, for that, like a year to year? Can they come back to you for multiple projects or is there a cutoff? Absolutely. Yeah. So there's payment limitations. Uh, you're eligible for $450,000 of financial assistance uh, per farm bill for our program. So every five years, you have a max $450,000 uh, that could be utilized. Um, and then basically, if you've signed up, you established your farm records with FSA, you did a high tunnel this year, the next year, there's far less paperwork that needs to be done. Once you're in the system, it's a lot easier to get signed up. Basically, you just submit a new application. Um, as long as nothing with the entity or, or land has changed, then you're in the system. It's just an application and the adjusted gross income form. Uh, which needs to be filled out every year you apply. And that's because we don't provide financial assistance if you make uh, $900,000 or more per year. And so basically it's uh, the adjusted gross income form is the, your average income of the three prior years of applying uh, to make sure that you're, you're not making more than $900,000 in those three years on average uh, to be eligible. Okay. Uh, so yeah, once once you're in the system, it's pretty easy to to keep utilizing our programs. <clears throat> and is the cost share match portion um, monetary only, or if a farmer, for instance, was able to get additional like in kind as part of that for building or other supplies, is that something that is taken into consideration, or is it just monetary match? It's yeah that.
Oh, Diane, can you hear me? I think we lost Frank. I do. I think, well, mine was acting up earlier, so I was thinking maybe it was on my end, but I think we lost Frank. I don't know, Sean, if you are, maybe you're in the same boat. You're in the same office. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still here. Yeah. I don't know what kind of happened here. Got a little stutter on, on Frank's end. I don't know if he's right next to it. If he wants to try to hop on yours, you obviously have your internet, but he looks like he yeah. popped off. So. Okay. It looks like his is completely gone. Where we got? Go on trying to get back here real quick. We weren't <laughs> sure if maybe like the meeting had ended on no six yeah six o'clock dot <laughs> i thought it was on my end for sure so um i don't know if he uh it is six o'clock i want to be um understanding of people's time as well but i want to make sure that if anybody has further questions for you or frank um that they can get those answered um in this meeting but if not we yeah, can also sure. like i said provide right. the follow-up yeah oh there Frank's coming back on. We'll see if he can. Well, in the meantime, though, while Frank's hopping back on, does anybody have additional questions for Frank or Sean before the meeting ends? I do want to make sure that everybody was able to ask any questions that, that they may have. Okay, can you hear me again? Yes. Welcome back, Hello, Frank. Back. Okay. I have no idea what happened there. Uh, it just completely disappeared. Um, <clears throat> all right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so, yeah, the question was, um, are we allowed to accept, or is a producer allowed to accept in-kind or other, other means of assistance in, while involved in our programs? Um, Yes, yeah, they can receive basically anything as long as as long as the project is being met to our standards uh, when we go out there, um, that's fine. We uh, we don't allow used materials for projects. Um, so it's not like if if someone has uh, old equipment or old supplies from a, a different project that's being donated to them um that would that we would have to look at a little bit further um but yeah we don't care if a landowner implements the project themselves or whether they hire a crew to implement a project um this this comes up a lot with forestry projects where say they have a, a 10 acre pre-commercial thin project or 50 acre pre-commercial thin project um they could hire a crew and have that project be implemented within one day and we go out certify it and make the payment on it or if they want to do that project themselves they they could do that and that's basically just their labor uh we just say this is what we're paying per acre for that particular project and, and make the payment once it meets our our requirements our standards okay Thank you. Um, while you were off, I encouraged other folks that are on if they have any questions to either type them in or please unmute yourself. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask Frank or Sean. Um, Diane, I don't know if you had anything else to say. Diane is a um, a really great partner here in Kitsap for um, she's with our conservation district as she already um, introduced herself, but uh, they also have additional programming. So um, I really rely heavily on uh, NRCS and Frank and now Sean, um, he'll be getting my my folks that I forward to them as well as Diane and the conservation district when we get farmers that come to us through WSU. I really rely heavily on them as partners because they do provide additional things that we don't provide here um, with our programming. So we all work really close together. Um, but Diane, I don't know if you have anything that you wanna plug for the conservation district with this group of offerings or programs or anything quickly that you think that comes to mind regarding this conversation. Not really, though. Um, one of the things that, that came up was reimbursement rates, and that for particularly for people farming on very small parcels. And it was exciting to me when I was talking to Frank earlier this year or last year, I guess, when they were we were asking about conservation practices for um, small sustainable farms and urban farms. Oh. I think you froze now, Diane. Oh no. Am I back? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yep. Oh, sorry about that. 
um, it was kind of encouraging to me that NRCS is um, able to fund uh, for at a higher rate than in the past for small and sustainable farming for project for for practices like cover cropping and hedgerow planting and those kinds of things. Yeah, our payment rates are are starting to change to reflect some of those small scale projects that are being implemented uh, in urban suburban areas or even in rural rural areas, but small farms. Um, so there's a lot of that coming out. Um, there's been a very large urban initiative through our, our agency over the last couple of years. Um, there's basically a whole entire new division being formed within our agency to, to look at those uh, communities and, and how we could provide assistance where we uh, previously have not been able to assist or our uh, payment rates may have not made a project worthwhile or, or uh, available for a producer to actually implement on a smaller scale. So there's a lot of that that's uh, starting to come out. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, I don't see any new questions. So I'm going to have last call here for any questions because um, I do want to uh, to adhere to the time for you, you and Sean as well, because I know that it's the evening and I just thank you so much for joining us. I think um, this has been a long time coming. I work with you guys separately. Um, Diane works with you separately. Farmers have benefited a lot from your guys' expertise and specifically yours, Frank, for how long you've been in our area and been able to assist farmers um, with your programming and your technical assistance. So I really appreciate you and, and wish you good luck in the future going into Wenatchee. And even though you're going to be leaving us, you're going to benefit them still with NRCS um, in new ways. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Sean, for being a resource. I'll go ahead um, for everybody uh, who signed up. I'll send out that email with the resources and a link to the video uh, most likely tomorrow. And um, it'll also include an eval just um, to provide some quick feedback from you on our uh, dirt talk in our class series. So um, please do us a favor and take that. It takes a minute or two to take that as well. So thank you all for your time. Um, and thank, Yeah, thank you, Jess, for putting this together. I really appreciate it. And uh, mm -hmm. my email will be staying the same. So feel free anybody to, to reach out always. So yeah. thank you. Thank you guys so much. Have a good night.